So I'm going to um, start off by introducing Naya, and then I'll kind of give the, the subject uh, matter, and then I'll go around and get everybody's, kind of just introduce ourselves, and um, I'd love to hear, well, I'll give you instructions for that, and then we'll kind of jump into the slides and go through it. So Naya, I actually met at Virginia Tech in 1997-ish, wouldn't it have been? I mean, I'm a 95, you're a 99 grad. Yes. I'm a 99 grad, but it was probably like halfway through that we actually, because yeah, we didn't Classes. Classes. We had marketing yeah. classes together. So I met, we are both are marketing grads from Virginia Tech same year, and so we ran into each other. They lost touch for probably 10 plus years after school, but ran in, I think, I don't exactly remember how it came up, but I came across yeah, like, it. You were in grid somehow, and I'm like, wow, yes. blast from the past. Yeah, yeah. Um, and Naya is an expert, and I mean expert, on all things um, creative financing. There are three specific topics that we'll kind of go through today of seller financing, subject to, or you know, buying a property subject to its existing mortgage, sub to for short, and um, lease options. We'll go through those, but there's more than just those three when yeah, it comes to creative finance. Yeah. There's so many different things, and Niall will certainly be able to share a lot about that. But this is a topic that's become increasingly popular be for a number of reasons, but one of which is because we've just come out of this super low interest rate environment for so long that there are maybe more opportunities. Hey, what's up, Juice? We have a seat. Um, there's maybe more opportunities than there have been in the past because the current interest rates are higher than what a lot of people have. And so you can buy a property and retain, I'm not using all the right vernacular, I'm sure, but like retain that existing mortgage and buy it subject to that loan. And so Naya has been doing this well before it was in vogue, um, you know, started in 2013. Yeah, that's when I did my first one. 2013. I got off of Craigslist. Off of Craigslist. Um, so uh, she's not just, you know, what I like, uh, what I love about having you come and share, Naya, is um, there's lots of people that are kind of starting to look into it more so now because you're like, hey, if I could buy that uh, house with a three and a half or a 2.75, whatever interest rate on its first mortgage, wouldn't that make more sense than trying to buy it, you know, with our, you know, uh, current 6% interest rates, whatever it might be. She's been doing this for 10 plus years. So like, you know, she knows the ups and the downs and all that kinds of stuff and it works in all seasons and I'm gonna have you share about that. Um, but there's other, there's other cool things that frankly, I'm pretty new at learning myself, um, but I have asked a tremendous amount of questions from some really intelligent people and I'm hoping to do a good job. Come on in, come on in, come on in. Um, helping to do a good job of regurgitating what I've learned recently uh, for, you, for you guys to learn. So before we get into that, however, um, as per usual, want to have everybody just go around the room, state, um, and we'll try and keep it maybe uh, 45 seconds or less, if at all pop possible, but your name, uh, what you are interested in with regards to real estate investing, or like what's got you out here tonight, but maybe most importantly, if you can, what are you looking for? Like, what is it that you would love to find somebody in this room or in other rooms or somebody in this room knows somebody that's doing what you're trying to get access to, whether it's, you know, borrow money, lend money, find deals, flip houses, wholesale properties, whatever it might be. So just say, if you have something you're interested in kind of getting connected, because afterwards we'll network and you guys might be able to remember who is it that's got the money and you need to borrow some and who's got the wholesale they need to uh, sell and you need to pick up a, a flip, etc. So start up here in the front. Phil, why don't you go ahead and give us your quick, you know, intro. I'm Phil. Um, seen a couple of you a couple times, so nice to see you guys again. Um, still new to real estate, so I'm kind of looking to see where I fall. So I don't have a specific one other than to learn to network. And then once I figure out exactly where I want to land, whether it is fix and flip, short term rental, long term rental, buy and hold, um, then I'll kind of know who I'm looking to get with. So awesome. Welcome Sorry, Phil. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> a little distracted. Omari. Hello, everyone. My name is Omari Fennell, and I'm interested in uh, providing affordable housing for those that are in need. So I'm, I'm looking in the next year or two to start purchasing rental units. And then eventually, um, I have a nonprofit that I'm a part of. We eventually want to create like uh, multi-family units, you know, uh, apartment complexes where people that are disadvantaged could have housing. Okay. So that's what we're looking to do. And that's, would that be around this area? Another? More so than okay. yeah. starting off, but then eventually we'll go other places. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
What's your name, young lady? You look familiar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my name is Rebecca. I am Matt's sister. Um, sorry, a little fib. Um, and I'm uh, here mainly because um, I've seen what Matt and Beth have been able to do, and I want more of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, uh, I haven't, um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I'd love to get into the place where I have um, investment properties and, and so forth, and um, also offering, if any of you all are ever in, for instance, what I do during my day job is a lot, um, I'm an attorney and I do estate planning and estate administration, so often folks um, will inherit homes that um, that they either don't want or they, they need some assistance with getting it retitled and, and whatnot, and um, they uh, I can help them through that probate process. Perfect. It's good having you in the room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. for real. It's, it, yeah. I find that... <laughs> yeah, that's just what some attorney. Uh, it's my fault. I should have told you. <laughs> um, I find that the real estate investor community is a little underprepared in estate planning like they're they're a lot you know they're shooting from the hip they're getting deals done but they're not like a, a lot of them are, are, yeah. are, are not doing things like a smart future efficiently and planning planning that's the word so yeah estate planning make sure you have a big stack of cards because we need to get you there's it just needs everybody needs a will if you're over 18 years of age you should have if you have one asset you're you should have a will so. um <laughs> Lady in the far left. Hey. Hi. Um, I'm Matt's wife. My name is Beth. I know most of you guys. Um, but I would like to uh, connect with people who are proficient in Airbnb. I'd like to get some details on that because some of you heard we're buying a lake house and we're going to Airbnb it. And so that's all new to me. I don't know how to do that. So. Yeah. Beth, I remember the last time we were here, you said you were looking for oh, it. Yeah. Right? I know. I know. Look how quick that happened. Yeah, yeah be sleep. careful what you say in this room. Yeah. <laughs> you may end up getting it in the next month. Yeah. So. <laughs> Second row. Uh, so I'm Brandon. Uh, meet y'all. I'm currently an investor, and I've been loving it so much. I want to help other people do it as well. Uh, so I just got my real estate license, and uh, I'm enjoying the Kyle group out of Reston. Uh, so hope to be able to uh, see what you guys need and help you out any way I can. And uh, I currently have one single family residence, uh, Airbnb. Um, so I uh, enjoyed the short term thing so far. Uh, let's let's <laughs> grow my portfolio. Yeah. Daniel? Uh, Daniel Annalise. Uh, all right. Um, married couple, work uh, with the Casa group uh, in Matt's office. Uh, realtors, love it, uh, love everything about this. What I'm looking for is I'm specifically trying to learn more about Section 8. I've got a lot of nuanced questions about it that I think can probably only be answered by people who have been doing it for a few years. So if anyone knows a lot about Section 8, I would love to have a conversation with you. Perfect. And you also have a little bit of a medium-term rental thing. Yes. That, is that if anybody wants to talk medium-term rentals, I will talk your ear off about it. Absolutely. <clears throat> I see some like, what's medium-term rentals? <laughs> All right, go, 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 go. We'll get y'all connected. Uh, Elise, anything to add? Um, we also have a podcast called Hell in the Market. Yes. And the purpose of our podcast is to help others see the... Um, Potential, potential for real estate to help yeah. them. Yeah, our tagline, building wealth. yeah, our tagline is building wealth in real estate. And um, I guess one of my goals today is to kind of find people who have a success story that they would like to tell and share. In that kind of real estate um, wealth building space. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, you're in the right spot. I can roll. Vinod. Hi, my name is Vinod Patel. Um, I'm just here to network with people and try to. Uh, again, the hard money lending side, i um, going to be coming to some uh, money, selling some businesses, so hopefully people are looking to, you know, need, need money for flipping, whatever, and then kind of, you know, get into that space of real estate. Um, on the side, I mean, I do some commercial, uh, have some self-storage facilities that I have partnered with, and I'm a pharmacist by profession, so that's kind of my day job. Yeah. Awesome. Right. Yeah. Thanks for knowing. Young gentleman in the far back, what are you here for? That's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting them out young. Yep. Yeah. This is the first time I'm, hey. like, I'm taking my 13 my year old this year, my 15 year old tomorrow, because I'm speaking right. at another meetup. So like, I want to expose them 
because you know they know that I'm in real estate, but they don't really know exactly what I do. So yeah, get them when they come on out. Um, and I see you doing a little social media work for mom as well. Yeah, Good so stuff. Can, take, I told him, take some take pictures, some pictures. take some video. And... Good. <laughs> um, in the back, yep. My name's Green Chavez. Um, I'm a flipper. Um, I also have some long term rentals. Um, I'm looking to get more rentals, some short term rentals. I can spend them more. And I'm just trying to make more money. Sweet. Awesome. Awesome. I'm Carla. Hi, Mary. Carla. <laughs> Carla's husband. Hey, Good to meet you, Hi. Carla's husband. Good to see you again, Carla. Uh, I actually run um, the grid in Fairfax. Oh, wow. Awesome. And we started this year, and I love to just support other people that have just started the grid meetings and also get to meet um, everyone. I watched one of your Facebook lives that you did, I think, with Rob, and I was like, oh, I'm going to come to Meet this Good. Hopefully, we'll do another. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, um, you know, we, we have been into this rhythm of a real estate agent. So I see that the creative um, financing part is something that I am not necessarily well versed in yet, but it just keeps happening. You know, once you're like starting to learn, I got so many people this year reaching out saying. This is an opportunity. What do I do? What do I do? And I just want to make sure that everyone connects and help each other. And that's that's what I'm here, here for. One big thing you skipped over, though, Carla, you're an amazing real estate agent that runs a very successful business in her own right. We've done, we're actually, we have a deal right now uh, under contract. She's representing the buyer. I'm representing the seller. Um, but that's our second or third, th second, third, I'm not exactly sure, deal that we've done. So she didn't even mention that she's a fantastic real estate agent as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Tyler Bailey. I'm a real estate agent with Casa Gainesville, Matt, Beth, Dan, and Louise. Um, just looking to meet some new people, network, learn more about real estate investing. Um, I would tell me something good. Let's go. To Matt and Dan's point, be careful what you say in this room. The first grid, we are here, we we're making our introductions. I said, I don't own any real estate. Rob Chavez corrected me, he said, yet, you don't own any real estate, uh -huh. yet. My wife and I are in a contract to buy our first house. Let's go! Next week. That's great. That's right, that's right. I want to make that close. I want to make that close. A month ago. How crazy is that? I'm closing party. I know. At your house. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, I'm Kenneth. Um, I'm basically just trying to learn a little bit more and uh, figure out some ways that I can acquire some additional assets that are going to make me money. Kenneth, what's your full timeline of work? Uh, software sales. Software sales. Cool. Yeah, I sell ERP software. I also own an online head shop. Oh, okay. And, uh, cool, didn't know that. That's cool. Both doing fairly well, and but also don't want to keep doing. I'm 40, 46. I was going to say 45, but that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And, I mean, I, you know, my day job's great, uh, but at the same time, I don't want to do it for another 20 years. And, and unless I figure out something else, then I am going to do it for another 20 years. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I'll also mention that you're sitting next to a big Cowboys fan. Oh, nice. <laughs> so, boo. Uh, Redskins fan in the back, uh, could you please finish this up? <laughs> uh, my name is Jess Sweet. I'm not in the real estate business at all, but my wife is. Some of you guys know her, Emily. Um, but I'm really interested in learning about subject two. Hopefully, one day I can do it by myself. Yeah. Um, I feel like in the same page as this, I'm, I work, I'm a sales rep. Don't want to, it's, it's good, but I don't want to stay there for long. So, I kind of want to do it as well. Figure out some alternatives. Yeah. Perfect. Um, you go and I'll go. Like same thing. A little introduction. But what are you looking for? Like what could what, what could you get out of the room? And then I'll give mine at the end. Okay. My intention, because intentions are so powerful. My intention is to bring as much value to you as I can, and I want to help you. The thing is, when I first learned about subject two, when I found out that you could buy a property and take over someone's loan, I'm like, I felt like I won the lottery. I was like, yes, like I really, I was that happy. And then within three weeks 
of me being so excited that, oh, I know my next deal is around the corner because I was flipping houses. I was rehabbing and using hard money lenders and I didn't like signing my name on a, with a, on a personal guarantee. <laughs> I, know you're hard, yeah. I use private lenders all the time. I just didn't feel comfortable like signing my name on a personal guarantee, especially after the market had crashed in 2009. And I had to short sell our house when he was like 18 months old. That was a, that was a really tough. So remembering that was, was just very painful. And I didn't want to lose a couple of rentals that I had already purchased. So when I found this strategy, I was like, yes, I know my deal's around the corner. And when I felt it, within three weeks, it showed up. We, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. We did a podcast that hasn't been um, published yet where we, myself, Rob, and a business partner of ours, Thomas, interviewed Naya, kind of like going through it. And she's got a really great story. I actually brought my notes oh, from, from our podcast. podcast. Like in 2007, like I have the whole thing, so I might reference this when we get into some other stuff. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, when she talks about like learning about this strategy, learning about this pos this option, this this even this tool in the toolbox of, of real estate investing, um, she said, you know, it felt like she won the lottery. I translated it in my mind of, of like being able to see the path of going from where you're at to where you kind of want to be, and like just having that. Shoot, you know, Kenneth, you kind of mentioned like, hey, I I got to do something a little bit different. I don't know. I don't want to keep just doing the same thing. That like epiphany of subject two, the way I translated it was like, okay, now I'm not there. I'm not where I want to be, but I can now see, can see how to it. get yeah, I could to that see spot. It. And I was like, why aren't people doing this? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm going to keep this secret to myself. <laughs> <laughs> and now she's here to share. And, and now okay. I'm here to share. Because it's, it's a people business. And I realized the more we care about other human beings, like guys, the money is, is like a side effect. So whenever I would go to a property and analyze it, get super excited, oh, there's 100K in this deal, 40. That, that feeling of like sometimes desperation, people can feel it. But when you have, you flip the intention and it's more like, let me solve someone's problem. So that's how I came up with my value amplifier method. Okay, and so many of you are real estate agents. So that customer service side is like second nature. You're in sales, you know this. So caring about someone and thinking about having, you know, how can I solve their problem? That's the secret, okay? Once you find the numbers behind it and then learn some creative strategies on how to structure it, then yeah, you, that's it's, the it's all done. Um, all right, so real quick, last introduction, and then we'll wrap up. I'm Matt Magel. I am the leader of this particular grid, Casa Gainesville. I'm also full-time a real estate agent. I focus specifically on Gainesville, Virginia, which of course spills over into Haymarket and Bristow and all things Northern Virginia, but Gainesville is where I live, work, play, um, invest. I have um, five rental properties that are in the Western Principal. Uh, yeah, one's in Bristow and the other four are in Gainesville proper. So like, I, I love Gainesville, I work on you know Gainesville. If you know anybody wanting to buy, sell, or invest in real estate, the reason I'm running this meeting is so that I can get my name out there and more people can say, hey, I've got a guy that runs all the Gainesville real estate, think about me. Um, that's number one. Number two is, um, uh, it'll come back to me, there was something I was like, don't forget to say that at the beginning. Okay, it'll come back to me. Let's jump into the subject matter for today. Actually, let's go through some like stuff. What is grid? We already kind of talked about that. Uh, global real estate community. We are not gurus. We are not teaching you exactly what you need to be doing. We're simply having a conversation about all things real estate investing. Some of the stuff we know really well. Some of the stuff we're not super um, familiar with. I think the next one is the legal. Uh, the legal. No, it's not. Uh, I'll go back to the legal thing in just a second. So. Um, it's just a bunch of people in the room talking about real estate. Our mission is to connect, learn from, collaborate with like-minded people interested in building wealth and creating impact through real estate. Naya just gave a great kind of an explanation about impacting people ultimately leads to wealth. When you put the wealth in front of impacting people, sometimes it doesn't go quite as well, or at least doesn't it doesn't not go through court. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we are uh, uh, welcome investors of all experience levels. I'm glad to see there's some people in here that have had some good deal of experience in short-term rentals. We've got some people that rent own you know, rental properties, commercial real estate, businesses, and then brand new folks who just got congratulations, your first house Ooh. under contract, off rock and roll. Um, we did this, who we are, why we run this group. Uh, we did this, 
legal stuff, this is what I was referring to. Like, this just says we're not real estate appraisers, tax advisors, any of that kinds of stuff. Do your own due diligence. Research YouTube. Um, don't sue us because we put this legal disclosure in there. All right, rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about owner financing subject to and lease options. Three incredibly powerful tools you need to kind of understand. What is owner financing? So I'm going to interview you. I'll throw my two cents in, but you know okay. all of this stuff. So, Naya, what is owner financing? That's when the seller, the owner, becomes a bank for you. Some almost a third of the properties in the US are paid off, they're free and clear. So imagine getting a property where you could get the seller to become the bank for you. I got one of those in Woodbridge at a 0% interest rate. Wow. Now that's a golden goose. Yes. That, that's my, my, my one property is gonna make me at least $700,000. Um, and they, I got them under contract, so they were they lived in North Carolina six months. They're absentee owners. Um, so they were tired landlords, and I had marketed to them for two years. Postcards? Letters? Letters. Okay. And when their tenant was about, the lease was about to expire uh, or be due, then they contacted me. They're like, we're thinking about um, selling the property or renewing the lease. Funny story. Um, the, he was a diplomat from another country. And he was a polygamist. He had two wives, one on one level and one on the other <laughs> oh level. Oh my so, 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 so the the seller wasn't too happy. She was a conservative lady, and she she, she wanted to sell the property. Um, the tenant. The was tenant. There to live in the. the yes, 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 wow. yes, 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 yes. So so anyways, I went to look at the property because they lived they were out of state. So when I looked at the property, it wasn't taken care of very well. So I took pictures and I sent them on to the sellers. I said, I would suggest you come and take a look or, you know, I can either buy it, I can give you an offer or I w if it was me, you know, I would not have him as a tenant anymore because they're not taking care of it as well. So I purchased the property, put 10% down, uh, 45K, it was like a $450,000 property, put 10% down and then they owner financed at a 0% interest rate for $2,500 a month and I'm renting it out for $3385. So I'm cash flow on the top and then reducing the principal balance by 30K every year. So it's going to be paid off in four more years. And your only expense is the dishwasher breaking or the refrigerator needing to put a new fridge Correct. in there Correct. kind of stuff, right? Like, Correct. I mean, because obviously other, wow. Correct. So, 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 solving so, problems. Solving problems. And they were happy. So the thing is, don't make assumptions. Never make assumptions. Um, don't think that people always need the money, their equity up front because that's not always the case. I have purchased properties for less than $5,000 here in Gainesville. Brand new property. What? Yeah, that was only four years old. Right behind the movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make assumptions, good Don't guy. Don't make assumptions. Okay, so why would a seller, uh, pros for the buyer is the next thing. So like, for you, the buyer. Um, pros for the buyer, I mean, pros for, guys. What's the pro for, for a buyer? You're leveraging, mm -hmm. okay? You're leveraging everything. Capital, someone else's loan, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. And you're build, creating wealth for yourself, for your family, I mean. You can close immediately. It has nothing I to do with your credit. I can close in a week. No. Right? I have not gotten a loan in my name since before 2010. Since before 2010, those were the rough ones. <laughs> She's like, I don't put them in my name. Anymore. I actually I haven't gotten a loan in my name. I, I have not gotten needed. I have not gotten a loan. Yeah, and you've purchased dozens of properties, or, or over dozen, 70 properties. 70 properties. 100 properties. I don't, I don't, I don't I lost track, and I've helped other investors do the same. Can I just uh, ask a quick question? Please. Is, is owner financing only really an option when the homes are completely paid off? No, 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 no. You could do a combination. Sorry. So if if let's say you had a loan on a property. Okay, and you had equity. Let's say it's a five hundred thousand dollar house. You have a loan on it for three hundred. Okay, and we negotiate the terms for the remainder of the equity. Now, just a note: I never bring more than ninety percent. I never pay more than ninety percent of the fair market value. Okay. So then, that way, immediately I have a ten percent equity off the bat, and people understand that, especially. If you're providing a service to them, 
Because if they were to sell the property with an agent, they would have to pay, you know, 3% for each side, that's 6%. And then closing costs is another 2 to 3%. So you're already at 90. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when you can explain this to them, I get them to, at 90% within the first 10 minutes of our conversation. Go back though, because I want to understand. So when you when there is that three hundred thousand dollar loan, how does the seller financing so, work? So the thing is, I can do a combination. So I take over the existing loan, subject to okay, okay, and then let's say ah, I have to bring twenty percent. Uh, let's say I bring twenty k out of the one hundred and fifty or the two hundred thousand dollars. That's the difference, right? So I bring the two hundred, the twenty dollars, the twenty k down, and if there's a hundred and fifty left or whatever we negotiate, then you become the bank. For the second lien, I can do a promissory note and a deed of trust for the second. And now we negotiate terms. When do we? When can we get those paid off? And usually my terms are always five years or more, sixty months or more. I want to buy myself time. Mm -hmm. And and you talk about the market. There are uncertainties, right? So I have no problem getting people to be willing to wait for sixty months. So the faster close, you don't need to use your credit, obviously, um, and lower closing costs. The closing costs are minimal. You've got to drop a deed, have a title company kind of just move. I guess there's I some mean, tax. I mean, I pay closing costs for both sides. Okay. So you, there, there's grant or taxes. So it all depends on your, your location, right? Your county, your state, and some states have you know, higher taxes than others. But you're not dealing with, obviously, there's a, there's percent right now with where interest rates are at. You're playing a couple of points on your loans right now, but you're not having to worry oh, about no, any no, of the, no, no. that stuff. So obviously, you know, greatly reducing the closing cost to just taxes and some title work. All um, right. And title insurance. And title I insurance. I always suggest you buy title insurance. Mm -hmm. even, even when the seller has the subject to? Yeah, I always like getting title insurance. I had a deal um, in D.C. that I was renovating and three months into the deal, I get a call from an attorney, and he says to me, the uh, his client had a lien on the property for seventy thousand dollars that never got paid off. How much? Seventy. Seventy. And I was like, well, that's not my problem. That's that's what title insurance is for. So, I always like title insurance, yeah. um, to just to protect yourself. Have you? spent more than seventy thousand dollars in title insurance over the years <laughs> probably not maybe getting close but like no, you've already it, recovered it, your money in one you know transaction yeah it, it, between fifteen hundred dollars to two thousand dollars when we're talking about five six hundred thousand dollar property right so it comes back yes it's, it's stuff will happen if you de interact with enough title companies you know this carly you'll interact with enough title companies they have horror stories of people thinking that they own the house but there is a missing this or a missing that, and all of a sudden, you know, they don't have a clear, you know, chain of custody on the title, and the whole asset is in jeopardy. So, so something I just found out myself. You, I, I closed on two properties last week um, in Texas, and Texas law, um, if it's an FHA or a VA loan, they, you cannot close with a title company. You can't get title insurance. Oh, no. Yeah, and I was like, what? Where did that happen? That doesn't happen in the D.C. metro area. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, yeah. so, so I, so FHA I'm, in Texas. So, so if it's a conventional, I got title insurance. But one of my properties that I purchased was uh, a VA loan. And because it was an underlying VA loan, the title company said we can't close. So I closed with an attorney instead. I still did all the closing, they did the title search, everything is fine, but I took the risk of like, well, whatever, this is going to be a great deal. Yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. All right. What are the pros for the seller? Why would a seller agree, this seller in, in Woodbridge, like, wow, well, why am I going to be the bank for you? What is the seller's benefit? First of all, benefit? it's a people business. So when you educate them and you show that you care, people do business with people they like and people they trust. If you like me and you trust me, the chances are you'll want to do business with me or you. It comes down to that. Um, that's what I have found. And I can close quickly. And they can move on with their life faster. So many people don't need the money now. That's why I say don't make assumptions. You don't know if someone wants to downsize and go to Florida. One of the properties that I purchased, okay, you guys are in the area, 
I purchased a property in Dominion Valley from a CIA agent, a retired CIA agent. And I moved in there with my family. I ran around, I moved in, I was like, oh, this is a great neighborhood. I'm going in right on the golf course. So he wanted to go to Florida and retire and play golf. He paid me $65,000 to buy his house because he bought it in 2005 from the builder and it was like over $800,000 and I got it for six fifty. dollars And was that a sub two, a seller it finance? Was, it was a sub two. It was a sub two and he paid me to buy right, the yeah, house. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's look at, look at it from a different perspective though because I want to get your thoughts on this. Would you ever sell or finance? Is there benefits like as the seller? Like I've thought about saying, hey, I you know, have a, a paid off asset. So, I so can... knowing what I know about real estate. Yes. Would I sell or finance? Absolutely. Would I do it subject to? No, I would do it differently. Right. So I would contract for deed, right? I would do it like, and I've done that before. Like, so let's, if you can't throw that subject, you can't throw that name out without giving a too quick intro tutorial on what is contract for deed. So contract for deed is we sign the documents, okay? And the deed stays in escrow, okay? Until the buyer performs. And when you perform, that's when it's out of escrow and you get recorded at the county, right? So let's say you and I purchase a property. You're the buyer and we have terms in there that you need to be making these monthly payments or there might be a balloon payment due in five years, right? Let's say if you perform, then knock on wood, something, whatever had to happen to me, the title is in escrow, then the deed is in escrow, you're done, that gets recorded. If you don't perform, it stays in my name. It's easier, it's, it protects me from having to f foreclose on you. It protects me from so many other. Yeah, so just, there, there's a distinction, right? Like you could be the owner of a property, free and clear, and say, hey, I'm gonna sell this, but I'm gonna sell it with seller financing. And mm -hmm. one of the benefits of seller financing, well, you'll kind of see here is, what, if, you, if you're choosing to proactively do this as a seller, you can say, hey, I'm going to sell it to you, but you don't have to go get pre-approved at a bank. You don't have to do this, that, and the other thing. I'm going to save you a bunch of money on your closing costs, but this $300,000 house of mine, I'm going to sell it to you for three twenty-five dollars 25 because you know, I'm providing a solution whereby you don't have to go out and kind of get a loan. And these are the terms of my our loan that we agreed to. Does the interest rate, does the amortization and schedule, And usually the interest rate is a lot higher than what's our A lot of business owners out there may have money, but they don't have the credit right? And they're willing to do seller finance. They're willing to put down 10, 20%, right? And pay higher interest rate, a couple points above what banks are giving. Yeah, absolutely. And if for whatever reason, like the contract for deed, you don't continue to make these payments based on our financing contract, then I can repossess the home. However, of course, that repossession does require like a regular bank, the sheriff, the, 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 all that kinds of paperwork to actually evict somebody from the property so that you can repossess it. And technically, you're the bank, you know, if you're the bank, just like Bank of America, you can then sell it again, if that makes sense. Contract for deed being a little bit different in that the deed isn't actually, it, excuse me, the seller financing, the property is now deeded over to that buyer, right? It is their house. You are simply the bank in that scenario. Contract for deed, the, you don't get the, the deed. deed is kind I'm of held in the owner. purgatory, <laughs> so to speak, until all of the terms of the contract have been satisfied, at which point there's a trigger to have it be released. Right. For, for tax purposes, um, you can still, you, the, you do your taxes if it's your house, as if you own it, you just don't have the deed. In the contract for the deed? the contract for deed. Gotcha. So they still get the interest, uh, excuse me, the uh, yeah, interest tax benefit, the correct. mortgage interest Cor tax benefit. Correct. Contract for yes. Deed. In seller financing, they do as well. I guess that's a, that's equal on both of those. Correct. Okay. Um, any questions about seller financing before we move on to the next? So you could do a combination, rough and. And then, it, it is, if at any point during the contract for deed process where the buyer um, fails, um, once again, I'm thinking about from an asset standpoint. If something were to happen, they were to pass away. They do not. There is no part of the asset that would be theirs until the deed is transferred. You, you so. want to hear a funny story? <laughs> sure. I had a property in Manassas that I sold it like this, like a double wrap, and I got, thank God, um, 
I had in a trust and my trustee was on this. So, so I get a call from my trustee and he's like, um, I got a call from a Fairfax County police detective. I don't know what it is. He's, and then my heart started beating. He's like, your property, and he told me the, the person's name, uh, is a drug dealer. He has seven jurisdictions after him. I'm like, ah! And they're like, they, they want you to contact them. And I'm like freaking out because I'm like, this guy is technically like a known or a, like a, that I sold it. They think that it's me because I had my trustee on there. So I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? I'm freaking out. Long story short, he went to jail. As to this day, he doesn't know what I know. Okay. He managed to make the monthly payments. Someone made the monthly payments. So, so they confiscated, I don't know, $50,000 cash and 30 pounds of weed. I don't know. He was a middleman. They were, they were trying to find the bigger guy. So anyways. But so I was like, so give me the, just because this is creative finance and creative finance. outside of what we, I don't understand, I don't understand a lot of this stuff. What is, <laughs> yeah, that's real creative. He's getting his finances creative. Um, what was a double wrap? Like, can you break down kind of like what yes, that is? Like, so how, double, so, what is that structure? So this property I had purchased for like $75,000. I took over a loan. Um, did you purchase it? Oh, what? How did you purchase it? Subject to the existing loan. Okay. But it was, uh, how do you call when someone breaks in and like tears a place up? Uh, squatters? Squatter, yes, squatters that was like vandalized. So vandalized, okay, my first language is Greek. So I came here when I was 11. That's, um, so the ag, that's where you get the accent from. So yes, they had squatters and the owner was in New York. Um, so the uh, property management company contacted me because I told them like, hey, I'll give you a referral fee if you refer anyone um, to me. And there was one small uh, subdivision that I had purchased like 10 properties in. So anyways, I, I got it for 70K. I renovated, I put like 15, 20 into it. And then I sold it for like 150, 175 or something like that. So that's a double wrap. So a loan, and then after I fixed it up, my price was higher, so you could sell it. I did seller financing on that person. Mm. So got it. So so the buyer of your property is going subject to the existing loan and uh, he does, no 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 it was like contract for deed he doesn't know all of this he doesn't know the inside so no as far got as it. he's concerned it was a hundred percent certified correct yeah. and then when he was incarcerated he still made the payment so at the end of it so this so this is what happened so he was incarcerated he made the payments and then I contacted him. Um, like a year or two later, the price had not appreciated that much, and he's like, "I just want to get out of it. I'm thinking about selling it." I'm like, "Instead of selling it, just did you know, just like just do the paperwork, give it back to us because there's no equity in there for you." Uh, so he walked away. I was like, oh, so hmm. mm. Hypothetically, could that buyer have then turned around and sold before he had completed the terms? Hypothetically, the way I had done it, because I had it with with a trust. Yes, could he have done something with it? Because the way I had done the paperwork with the attorney at the time, even though I had my own trustee on, uh -huh. on there, he had the right to to do anything he wanted with the property. Gotcha. And it would just pay you off. Correct. And then okay. he, he would have had to pay me off on the terms. Okay. Uh, yeah. Man, there's a rabbit hole to go down here. Someone wraps mm -hmm. the rabbit on knowing it's wrapped. <laughs> no, uh, the funny thing is, like, I was, away, I, I was afraid that Prince William County or, like, all these, you know, jurisdictions, like, eminent domain, that they were going to take my house. And then I was like, how am I going to be making these payments oh, yeah. to the first owner the, the, that I purchased no, the property the $70, to? The $70,000 original, yeah. uh, original subject to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. So they have an example here that they kind of walk through. Uh, and I, I, uh, I? I owner think. financed a property earlier this year that I, oh this is Rob talking this yeah, is Rob my business partner yeah. Rob's example so <laughs> I Matt Mabel had nothing to do with this um, I owner financed a property earlier this year that I owned free and clear I received multiple offers some had traditional financing others wanted me to be the lender I chose an offer that was twenty thousand above the best traditionally financed offer uh, the buyer put twenty percent down I agreed to finance the balance for five years at a six percent interest rate amortized over thirty so okay break this down so. Let's say a house is worth a hundred thousand for simplest, simple, super simple math. A hundred thousand dollars. Um, he got offers uh, that the best traditional offer was that hundred thousand dollars. He said, "I'll be the owner, 
and uh, <coughs> seller finance this to somebody who's like, I'll pay $120,000 because I don't have the ability to qualify for the loan myself. I still want to be able to buy the house. Help me out, owner. The house was free and clear. He, he had the ability the to do that. He became the bank. Um, and that buyer, like to your point, sometimes people are business owners that they don't have the taxes done right in a way that a traditional lender is going to give them as much money. Trust me, we've been through that. Um, but uh, you know that they're not going to give you as much money as maybe you would uh, be able to get if you were get, making that same kind of money as like a W-2. So they're in a tough spot financially, but they have the cash flow. They make their business makes good money. They just don't have the ability to get loans. So they put 20% down, sold it for 120. They gave Rob twenty thousand dollars. Twenty four. Yeah, twenty four. Give them. Yeah, should I should have started at eighty. What do I do here anyway? Um, but they gave him twenty thousand dollars up front so that he had that as a down payment, and the remaining hundred thousand he financed for five years with an amortization payment on thirty, meaning the buyer had to pay this loan completely oh, off in five, yeah, in five years, but the monthly payments were as though he could keep it for thirty. So it was still like you know a on $100,000, let's say it's a $600 a month payment, but you only got, you know, uh, five times, you only got 60 months, and the whole thing's got to be paid off. So, so you like, had to refinance. Had to refinance, get out, or, you know, lose, you know, the deal, uh, and so on and so forth. So that's a way that, you know, Rob, as an example, was able to sell it for more, and we'll see if it ends up, if the guy ends up making it, being able to pay it off, get re legitimate financing, you know, for, on his own, to be able to just, you know, pay the house and pay Rob his portion off. So that's one example. Let's see if there's... No, I had an attorney draft up the promissory note. I had a title couple hand, hand, handle everything else. It was really simple, easy, fast kind of way to do that as a free and clear, you know, owner. I know, I've heard of a story. A guy, I think it was on a podcast. No, no, no. It was a book. It was, a, it was an audible book where a guy sold his house owner financing three times because the people never actually executed the terms of the deal. And he was like, this is the greatest you, if you take the, the down payments, you keep it. Yeah, the, yeah, the deposits great. or down payments are non-refundable. You get, you know, and granted, you don't do this without genuinely wanting to sell it to the other person, right? You can't. You you're losing control of the asset. Yeah, they well, you know, they may very well may perform. Yeah, it, it's very important for for you to keep your promises too, right? The property that I purchased, that the seller became the bank for me, I brought forty five k to the table. Okay, there's no way in hell am I gonna miss the twenty five hundred dollar mortgage payment. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you handle the five year balloon? Do you ever have five year balloons, or do you just never? So I I have usually five years for the equity. Mm -hmm. Um, just like the deal I talked about earlier, right? If I take over subject two, so I'm thinking of a couple of exits. Yeah. One of the exits is like I could sell another property. Mm -hmm. And if I owe you 70K, mm -hmm. I can come to you and say, you know what? Instead of waiting for five years, if I'm at year three, mm -hmm. would you take 50K instead of 70K? Mm -hmm. And now I can pay that off if I want to keep it long term. Yeah. Or, or, or two, you know, I could sell it, right. okay, um, and then pay that. But there's always room for negotiation. So depending on your exit strategy, many times I do leasehold options to buy mm -hmm. when I exit. So then that way, I get a down payment. Mm -hmm. from Which, my by the way, that's our third tool. We're going, okay. so say the story. Okay. We, guys, I want to hear that one, but it'll, be, yeah, it'll that, make sense that, when we get to that. I am glad that we, we touched on the subject because it's something that I've often thought about that doesn't really get discussed on these discussions for sub two and seller finance. How to handle the balloon port? Yeah, how to yeah. handle the balloon. Because, yeah. I mean, she even opened up our discussion today of saying she has not had a loan in her name. So I, I thought to myself, when we get to, you know, out of the balloon and trying to go to a firm loan, mm -hmm. what, what yeah. is she using for that? Yeah, so, and... Well, that's really you know, in the higher interest rate environments, you know this representing a lot of buyers right now, mm -hmm. the lenders are talking more arm type of things. Hey, you know, you could get a lower interest rate if you did this five-year arm, seven-year arm, three-year arm, whatever it might be. If we, there's a number of real estate professionals in here, if we're quote unquote allowing, as much as you can allow a client to do something, you know, allowing somebody to use one of those loans that does have either a balloon or it has a potential big jump in interest rate after you know a set amount of years, we do need some exits. We need some options as to creative ways for them to figure out how they can navigate that situation. Well, uh, that happened to a lot of us 
Okay. Um, in 2005, I purchased the property uh, from a builder with an interest only loan. Okay. The, and then the economy crashed, the loan t changed. Like, yeah. And so many people's mortgage payments doubled. Okay. <laughs> so. Thanks. I informing your clients is the biggest thing. The decision is theirs whether you want to allow them or not. It's, yeah, not, exactly, it's yeah. not your choice. All right, so strategy two, the queen of subject two. What is subject two? Break it down. Everybody in the room is in third grade. What's subject two? So you're buying a property subject to an existing loan. So every settlement, see, like a HUD one or an Alta, has a line in there that says subject to an existing loan. So if there's, an under, if there's a loan in place, okay, you're buying it as a wrap, subject to that loan. Um, and that's how I explain it to sellers too. Some of the logistics of that means that the loan doesn't change ownership. No, the loan stays in place, okay, until I sell it to my buyer. So I communicate to the sellers that it will still show up under their credit, so if there's a credit report down the road or if they're buying another house, it still shows up. Now tell me what kind of an objection that will give me. What if you don't make my payments? Very good objection. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so good at yeah. objections. <laughs> I'll say, well, obviously, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, that won't be the case. I'm not going to miss a $2,000 mortgage payment or a thousand or whatever the amount is and not because I won't make my profit on the back end when I sell the property, right? And they're like, well, what if you do miss a mortgage payment? And I'll say, well, I will give the house back to you. I want to reassure them that I'm credible. And the other thing is, this is a, it's based on trust. I purchased a property in Gainesville from a former federal judge and I structured it creatively. So I took over an existing loan and he seller financed $300,000. So I didn't know he was a judge until the day after closing. Mm -hmm. Thank God, because I think I would have been a little nervous. So yeah, I'm like, um, but, but yeah, so former federal judge and I have a notarized testimonial from him. So you have to be upfront and credibility and trust is, is huge. So, so let's talk some logistics in this because this I had to wrap my brain around like hold on a second. What? How does this work? Why does this work? Let's say you are you can you get effective at understanding what long term rental um, prices should be like meaning like what you can rent a house for and you say hey houses in this neighborhood this square footage bedroom bathroom count elementary school etc these are renting for three thousand dollars a month. The owner that's in that that's currently in that property that's interested in selling, maybe they've got some problem that you can kind of solve to let them get out of the house, has been there for 10 years. And so, you know, they bought it for, you know, a lot less. The values have gone up. They're still on a maybe a loan that they refinanced um, five years ago at 3% interest rates. And so their mortgage payment is somewhere around uh, $2,000 a month, something like that. You're like, okay, well, I got this thousand, and of course, now the balance might be, uh, let's say, three fifty. The house is worth now six fifty. So you got this three hundred thousand dollars in equity that's still in there. But you're like, okay, I got a thousand dollars gap between where they're making their payment and what the rental comps are. Is there a way that I could buy this house subject to that two thousand dollars and still make money with this thousand? Now they're like, well, what are you going to pay me for that three hundred thousand? Well. I could bring a down payment and I could owner finance it. What if I were to owner finance the other portion? This might be not describing the most um, uh, attractive of deals, and I'm sure you can kind of give me a better example in just a second, but um, like, hey, what if I were to seller finance this from you? I'll bring you $20,000 as a down payment, you know, or $30,000, 10% as a deposit on the you know, seller financing $300,000 gap. That other $270,000, I'm going to pay that over, you know, a 30-year time frame with a blah, blah, blah. You can creatively that, do all these exactly things. That's exactly what I did with a judge. 
with the judge, and then you're paying hypothetically 600 bucks, so you know this property, you gave them 30,000, this property's gonna cash flow at let's say $400 a month. You got 600 going to them, 2,000. So you can kind of take this full pie that you know is like what rental comps are, and then start kind of compartmentalizing what's gonna have to get paid to who. Based on their needs. That's where asking questions is key, right? You, your, your goal is to give bring value right, and solve somebody's problem. And their problem could very well be, I just need to move out of the area. I need to downsize, I have a job relocation, I'm going through a divorce, someone died, this is a burden, all right? Yeah. So you can solve that problem, okay? Obviously, never take someone's problem and make it your problem. I'm not in that business to, to do that. And, you know, I want to always make sure that I get to leverage and you always have to buy right. That's why I say I never pay more than 90% of the fair market value. Um, questions, general questions about that idea. Does that make sense? Like that, the general concept makes sense? Any questions? I just, I, I guess like I wanted to know, like how do you, who does your paperwork? Attorney, I mean I have a, so I have paperwork, I have certain disclosures, right? Um, I put my properties in a land trust, okay? Uh, land trust. Land trust. Okay. Um, one, one land trust and then for each individual. Every property is in a different land trust. So okay. and I ha every so in order to be in a trust, I have a trustee on, on record. You could be one trustee. You know, everyone could be a trustee. Um, trustee doesn't mean that you own it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, it's just your name is on the on title. You're the one that gets the call from the cops, basically. When <laughs> you, you'll get the... <laughs> I said, I said, I said, it's, it's, it's Facebook Live. <laughs> I don't want to scare you, my trustees. I only have it <laughs> yeah, one exactly. time. Yeah. No, 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 no. But, but they have nothing to worry about. I mean... And correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the benefits of that is that you can name the land trust essentially the same thing as the address. That way, the bank is not going to be uh, all up in arms because they're not going to be seeing your name necessarily. I have something better. Okay, tell me. I, I, this is this, I can tell by how slow you're starting to say this, and that I had a conversation with you. Like, this is a, this is a nugget. You're gonna give them something nugget. that they should be paying for. Golden nugget, basically. Yeah, okay. you need to be paying for. So my this is what I want out of this room. Find some deals and let's do them together, people. Okay. Okay. Um, so win win. So the nugget is this: you buy the property, and the land trust is in the seller's last name, trust. So it looks like estate oh. planning. Ching, 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 ching. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's federal law that you cannot um, call on a loan that was put in a trust for uh, estate planning purposes, like put into a living trust. So. And they don't know. You don't. You're they don't not, know what kind of trust you're not it is. Fictionalizing that it was estate planning, but banks get those kinds of notifications all the time when people are doing their estate plan. They say, "Yeah, we're going to put this property into a trust," and oftentimes the trust is the Smith family, you know, one, two, three Main Street family trust or whatever it might be, or land trust. Excuse me, I don't mean to say family trust. But the, the, um, I've also worked with underwriters, mm -hmm. and no bank. I mean, I have not come across a bank that's yeah. going to take a performing loan and put it in a non-performing category. That's stupid, yeah. right? So chances are, even if you put it in an LLC or you, you didn't do it the right way, mm -hmm. okay, you might have a property that you have in your, in your name, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And all of a sudden you say, for tax purposes or I want to run it as a business, you did it to your LLC. Mm -hmm. Did you technically... Violate the doing self laws? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is the bank going to care? Are they going to call the loan due because? No. Show of hands, does anybody have it happen? Mm -mm. Yeah, we we're Dan Dan's <laughs> mentioned so we were in a, a meetup just like this, but you know with uh, what seventy people or whatever it was last week. Carla was there, Dan was there, um, and they actually said with people with incredibly diverse um real estate investing backgrounds like from the newest guy to a guy that's you know done thousands of you know renovations etc have you ever had a do on sale clause actually um you know make you lose a property and make you have to accelerate your payment to have it completely paid off and one guy was so bold he's like no i know somebody who got the do on sale clause notification 
He threw it in the trash, kept making the payments, and they never called him back again. <laughs> it was like, so anything is possible, and you have to be you know, obviously aware of the risks that you're taking. But yes, banks are in the business of getting money. They're not in the bank, they're business of, of repossessing homes. Frankly, when they had to, they freaking hated it. You know, that was when I got started in the real estate industry in 2008, 9, 10, and these banks were like, well, just keep making the payments, please. Short it, just don't give it back to us. I mean, yeah. like, they don't want to deal with that. So, very unlikely. Um, we're in the process of putting, um, uh, Facebook Live. Uh, we're in the process of putting a bunch of our rental properties into LLCs for you know proper planning purposes. I don't expect to have any you know issues uh, along those lines as well. So, all right. Um, yes. Land trust. How, yeah. Does that impact your exit at all? Not really. Well, how would it impact my exit? I don't know. I've never worked with a land trust, so I don't know. No. Okay. Th this is the other thing. Um, if it's somebody else's, if you have a trustee, mm -hmm. okay. And you're, ma you want to, you're managing your own property. So for a potential tenant, they think that the trustee is the owner. Mm -hmm. So you're a landlord. Mm -hmm. You're just managing the property. So it's good to have that flexibility mm -hmm. because it's always good to have a good cop, bad cop, yes. even though you're the one that's handling it all. If you have a tenant who's not paying, yeah. hey, guess what? The owner is giving me a hard time. I need you to pay, or here's your five-day pay or quit notice. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah, there is a there is a level of um, separation that you can kind of have. Correct. You always the, want to have a level of separation. That yeah. it's you know that you can simply do what the business needs to have done. Correct. I need to follow our <coughs> company policy. <coughs> yeah. Um, yes. Um, so say. Um, and I'm going to do this. Remind me to do this going forward. But you asked the question. I'm going to kind of restate the question only because I think the microphone's not going to pick up the question. But help me remember that, and you help me remember that. But go ahead. What's the question? So. Um, you say I know you say you don't have, you haven't had a loan um, under your name, um, but say for like a normal person, they after the five years the new payment and you want to do a refinance um, and um, to pay off the remainder, um, but if it's in a trust or in the LLC or something, are you gonna have issues there? Question is like if you have a balloon payment on a loan, but the house is in a land trust, does that cause problems for conventional financing if you're trying to you know get it into your own? No, financing. so depending on the lender, that if you're trying to refinance it yourself, if it's one of your properties that you're trying to refinance, because let's say you have a lot of equity, okay, you could do a deed. You could do like a quick claim deed if you want to your name, if you want to refinance it in your own name. Yeah, but if you have it like a, uh, like a subject to part of it. That doesn't, then, doesn't matter because then... it's, you, it's your property. Right. So technically sell it to yourself, but you're not really selling it. Okay. You're redeeding it. You're simply changing the de whole yeah. the deed is held. I've had, a, I've had that problem where I had to go and do a deed change, put mm -hmm. it back in my name, just to do something. I had to I do it too, something. because sometimes um, years ago, uh, I was trying to refinance uh, loans, and because I had moved them into my LLC, I was talking about like 15 years ago, because I had put it in my LLC, because I was the one be personally getting the loan. The, the bank forced me to put it back in my name, to do the closing, blah, blah, blah. And we just, we do see that a lot when we're doing uh, land record searches, um, taking things in and out of trust or estate planning, and you'll see three deeds all recorded on the same day. It's me and, me and myself, myself to so another, another party, party, another party back record. into the trust, and they just, Record them 15 minutes apart. <laughs> wow. So, just hiding it so well. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, subject. Uh, let's just see whether we've got here to make sure we don't fall off too far off track. Um, why would why would a seller do that? Oh, here's one thing that I know we did. Sometimes like, why would a seller do that? We had. Um, I say we. I wasn't party to this, but Casas. Sell Simply Company, which is in the business of buying property. Um, predominantly for uh, short-term rentals in like the Shenandoah Valley area right now, um, bought a house subject to because the seller had fallen way, way, way behind I in their them. mortgage. Yeah, you kind of guided them through this process. 
fell way, way, way behind in their mortgage. They just needed to get out. The house didn't have a lot of equity in it in this particular case. It could have. Maybe that it would had have been, two loans. It had a, a second mortgage. Really, it was kind of like a loan modification that became a second lien on the property that had not been paid in years as long as, as well as the first mortgage had been paid in years. I helped them reduce that. Oh, yeah. I'm going to have percent. you share about what the, your advice was to Mike. Because he was like, How, you know, I'm going to have you share that. But like, the point was, the seller's problem was sh her credit was in the trash. She was going to be foreclosed on in this house. The house didn't really have any equity. She just needed somebody to solve the problem. And so Rob and Mike, with Naya's assistance, um, came in and said, hey, we'll just buy, we'll, we'll buy the house subject to the existing loan, this bad loan. This loan's, you know, foreclosure proceedings are going to start at some point. It. But they were going to make a 30 something thousand dollar payment to bring it current. Mm -hmm. Instead of her getting foreclosed on, all of a sudden, some buyer who's using the method of subject to is going to solve her problem. And all of a sudden, the bank is going to think her loan started getting paid again magically, like she hit the lottery. And so she could actually have her credit improved instead of just, you know, having it. Um, uh, it being sold and that continuing to remain a stain, like the bank says, oh, cool, now you're paying. We're going to start recording these good payments. This is a... Yeah. That's oh, it. Yeah. So okay. this is... Even more, yeah, seven years or so yeah, without being able to get... This is a very good strategy when the market changes and a lot of people are facing foreclosure. This is... Like, you're bringing so much value. You're helping these sellers. Okay, obviously, don't do this if the numbers don't make sense, right? You're not going to make take someone's problem, make it your problem. But if there's equity there, and sometimes there could be a lot of equity, okay? If you even wanted to bring money to the table, you could. You reinstate the loan, okay, meaning make it current. So you're helping with our credit, okay? And you're making the monthly payments. And then whenever you exit, I've seen a lot of investors say, okay, we will split the profit. Um, but this is a very good strategy to help people who are in situations. The only problem is this. People who are going through foreclosure, they're getting very sentimental. They don't want to lose their house. Um, and the motivation curve is, is very low. So you, you need to have multiple touches, like marketing. You need to be sending them letters like every week, every two weeks, especially in that pre-foreclosure stage, because motivation is like, no, 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 it's not happening to me, it's not happening to me. As soon as I get the auction date due, woo, motivation changes. Mm -hmm. really, they're trying to figure, how can I stop it? How can I stop this? Talk about that second, though. So in this deal that we were describing, they had a, a, a loan I think modification. Like 50 or $70, it was like seventy five, seventy five thousand dollars second. So I, I, I talked to, I coached Mike. I'm like, he was thinking, I'm like, so this is, you know, you have to write a hardship letter, blah blah blah. You're helping the lady out because her partner, I don't know if it was her husband or not, but died. So the the, the situation, she had already moved down. So. And it needed to be a gut job, so it needed a lot of renovation. Um, so I told him to go back to the second lien, the lender, and negotiate and say, listen, this is going to go to foreclosure, okay? You're going to be wiped out because the first is this much, and then by the time any, any investor buys it and they need to renovate it, you're going to be wiped out. So do, would you like something versus nothing? And I, and I told him, like, just start off with, like, 5 to 10%. Give him an offer of that. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, let's just try it. And he did, and it worked. Yeah. So, yeah. So they got the seven, the $75,000 second mortgage, and there's more to it. We'll explain in just a second. But the $75,000 mortgage was willing to take $7,500 to release the lien on the property. Mm -hmm. Now, what oftentimes happens in this case is probably none of this. So it's brilliant advice. We like offer five percent, and they did. He ended up offering ten percent, probably because only his own limiting belief wouldn't let him offer much less than that when he probably could have. Because what happens was this was a second a, a balloon. Uh, excuse me, a loan modification second mortgage that was created through a hardship scenario that was then ultimately sold to another debt collector. It was for, a debt collector. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. it was sold from the original bank, who still held the first. They took the second, and they just sold that debt to somebody else, saying, "Hey, if you can collect on it, it's fine." And if you know anything about debt collections, when somebody sells second hand I, debt, I, it's it, they sell it for pennies on the dollar. It was a bad bad loan because it had some crazy interest rate. It had like a ten percent, some 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 crazy interest rate. And I was like, "This is 
fraud. And I said, this is, um, yeah, like, there's no predatory. way. Huh? It was predatory. predatory. That's exactly what I said to him. I'm like, this is predatory. And nobody's been paying on this thing for three, four, five years. Like, they were just kind of counting debt on top of debt as it was just kind of, like, growing. But it was, it was a monster with no teeth because the, the company that bought it probably bought it for, like, $1,000 or something like that. When they get the call saying, hey, we'll, we're gonna, you're going to be foreclosed on, so you're going to end up getting nothing when the first mortgage acquire, you know, gets their piece of the puzzle. Um, here's 7500 bucks. They're like, <laughs> and so they take it. So you don't, to your point, don't make assumptions. Yeah. Go in and explain, you know, learn as much as you can and make something that you're like, hey, this is actually a win for you. You think, oh, these people are losing 67000 No, they're not losing $67,000. They made five k And they can write it off. And hey, like like Seinfeld, it's a write off. Right? <laughs> they were never going to get it anyway. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, they were they were probably going to get nothing ultimately. Um, okay, so we talked a lot about these pros for sellers solves a problem, gets them the money they need, but typically in a delayed fashion. I'm not sure exactly what Mark means about that, but maybe you can explain that and can help them build back their credit. That's a big deal, right? We talked about this lady situation where she was behind on her mortgage payment. All of a sudden, she got caught up. So yes, she has other financial challenges that she's certainly going to have to kind of figure out to move forward, but she's not going to be stuck behind a seven-year foreclosure or a three-year um, short sale kind of credit you know, ding. She's able to kind of get stuff caught up and looks like she's made right. What is the, what do you think they mean so by the money you, they need? The money they need to move out. Maybe you'll give them a couple thousand dollars, what they need just to, to move out. And I've done this, you know, many times with sellers who are in this type of situation. Like you're helping them out, and like I've given them, even though the the equity was like tight, but the human side was like, gosh, let me solve, you. Let, let me just help him out. I'm still there's still money in the in, in yeah. this deal, um, but I'll let him. So this is what you do, especially with pre foreclosures. Don't let them stay in the property. Don't make them a tenant. So many investors are like, oh, yeah, I'm going to reinstate this. I'll do the house. And then they're like, yes, we can pay you. Guys, never do that. <laughs> never, never, never do that. Okay? It, it never. You need to get them out. And if you're planning on giving them some money at closing, I make sure I say, and if it, especially if you're stopping an auction date in like two weeks, Right, which I've done before, they can't move out in two weeks. So what I do is I say, hey, the $5,000 or the $10,000 I was gonna give them, they're in escrow, you're gonna get that money once you move out. Mm -hmm. So you incentivize them to move out. Mm -hmm. You don't want them in there because you don't want them down there. Do you know how hard it would be to get them out? And then they could say, I don't know I sold the house. Mm -hmm. This is my house. Obviously there's disclosures, things that you I put in place to make sure that doesn't happen. <clears throat> Yeah, that's a, you know. Yeah, so you're helping someone out, but when it comes to pre-foreclosures and if you're reinstating a loan, never reinstate a loan, okay, before you get the deed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Pros for the buyer. Why would a buyer consider, you know, selling their property? Excuse me, why would a buyer like Naya consider using subject to it? She's been giving you these, you know, these benefits and kind of doing it, but... Buyer does not need to get you know traditional financing. Hasn't had a loan in her name in umpteen years. Um, they do own the house. The deed is transferred ownership over to the new person. It's not like that contract for deed where it's kind of held in escrow. It's your house at that point, and um, uh, they can build equity faster based on an amortization schedule. We talked a little bit about a deal that we were looking at, and maybe just share because we didn't get too much into it. But the whole idea that like it's not just the appreciation or the potential cash flow. It's also calculating the principal pay down um, yeah, principal on balance these houses. Every month. So especially with low interest rates. Or, um, or for ones that are 10 years into their amortization schedule. Yeah, they're whether they're five, years in, who like, cares? But like the further in, the more the, that it's the, more, the bigger yeah, percentage. So you could get, imagine having a house that has a $2,500 mortgage, stay, mortgage payment and mm -hmm. 1,500 of that is going towards the principal. How cool is that? I think a lot of times people are a little myopic when they talk about, you know, what is the wealth benefit, as meaning the larger term, of the different compartments of the real estate, you know, payment or, you know, the monthly payment, right? You've got, or the real estate game, I should just, overall, 
You've got appreciation, which is pretty straightforward. Hey, I bought this house for $400,000 five years ago. Now it's $500,000. That's $100,000 in net worth growth. Like that's a simple thing. Um, hey, I, I pay a bank or you know through creative financing, I pay a number of people uh, $2,000 a month for a house and I'm renting it for $2,500 a month. Well, that's $500 a month times 12 months, $6,000 a year. Those are easy. The principal pay down, the amount that the debt is actually being reduced through those payments is oftentimes a bit of a hidden benefit that people really have to be mindful of because like, well, one of the reasons why it's a bit complicated is because virtually all amortization schedules mean that the amount of principal is actually changing every single month, right? It'd be easier if it was like, hey, it's $600 every single month forever. No, it's 601, then 603, then 60450, then, you know, like it actually changes every single month, but every year you can calculate how much has that gone down. So when you own real estate through creative financing or even just the more traditional things, you've got principal reduction, cash flow if it's a rental property, and appreciation, hopefully the property yeah, is depreciated. And depreciation. Oh, and, de and depreciation, and from depreciation from tax. I mean, like, there's a lot of stuff there's kind of going on. There's an yeah. acronym for that called IDEAL. Right? Yeah, what is that? Give the acronym. I is for income, D is for depreciation, E is for equity, mm -hmm. A is for appreciation, and the L is for leverage. Yeah. And what is the E, the equity is the principal pay down? Is that what they mean by that? Gotcha. Yeah. And then the L is for leverage, meaning it's not active? Meaning I can control a bunch of them. Yeah, a Got lot it. of assets with a very small amount of money. Right. Yeah, le oh, the, the ability to use other people's money, sorry, is yes. what the leverage piece is. Yeah. Use other people's money to build your wealth. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. well. I mean, even if you're using a bank, it's still leverage. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. you're not, for sure. You're not bringing your own money yeah. to the table. But yeah, imagine... These, these strategies, it's still leverage. Of course. Right? Everything is leverage. I'm all about working smart, not working hard, guys. Oh, yeah. Okay, oh, uh, you know, and, and for me to rehab nowadays, like it's it is, very active. Huh? It's I'm very in the active. middle of the rehab right now. Oh, yeah. I, I have Busy? a property. Yeah, I'm going to be done s soon this month. But I'm saying, unless the number, unless it's gonna, the property is going to make me like 100K or more, mm -hmm. I'm not going to go through that headache of dealing with contractors or managing a property or doing all that. Um, 70 to 80% of the properties I buy are pretty houses. Are what houses? Pretty. 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 Oh, okay, gotcha. Guaranteed. What, just curious, this is a little off topic, what is the, currently, the average turnaround time on a renovation for yourself? Like, what, how much time are you in a project? Um, usually, like, okay, the ones that are renovated in 2022 uh, and 2021, it was quick, like, 45 days, some of them. Um, Talking about lipstick. Yeah, like, quick. Not a lipstick. I'm the uh, bathrooms, kitchens, flooring. Flipping bathrooms and kitchens in 45 yeah, 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 yeah. days? Yeah, yeah, I could do it. Yeah, I need 45, your 60 days. <laughs> yeah, please. Um, <laughs> but 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 on this one, it's a little longer because I've been delayed because of material. Okay. Like Home Depot, my cabinets um, were delayed a month. Um, you know, mm. egress windows. The, a lot of things have back have been back ordered. So materials, and then if you're getting things inspected, if it doesn't pass inspection, we didn't have our plumbing pass, so that we had to fix it. And you waste a week here, you waste a week there. Yeah. Gotcha. So average now, ninety. Yeah. Ninety days. Yeah, I mean, it's still pretty good. No, that's great. Ninety days with material delays. It's yeah, wicked ninety, fast or even if it's one hundred twenty, who cares? It's it's gonna turn around. Yeah. And th that renovation, are you doing that? You're, you're not hard money, no hard money. These are all subject to deals or something. Actually, this one that I purchased, yeah. I got it in my self-directed IRA. And mm -hmm. the seller paid me $32,000 to buy it. Because they were a bit upside down? Because they were a bit upside down and it needed work. You needed to get out. And, and because I knew my exit was to flip it quickly, I decided to do it in my self-directed IRA so that way when I sell it, I won't get hit with the taxes, ordinary income versus capital gains. And because it's in my IRA, it goes back in my IRA. I can't touch it personally, mm -hmm. but it's tax-free. Yeah, it's a really powerful strategy. You, did you have a question? I saw your hand up though. Uh, it, me? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, sorry, it, I thought you did. off topic, but uh, you mentioned egress windows, so I'm assuming you're adding more bedrooms. Are you getting... Uh, I added a bedroom. Are you um, having any of your contractors deal with the... 
thing I'm thinking of where you go to the county and permit. Yes. Or, yeah, are you having permits yourself or are you having contractors do that? So I have a front question. Of my sorry, the question is do you do pull your own permits for so, adding so basement yes, windows? Like a little both. So one of my friends is a contractor, so like a licensed engineer. So he did the drawings, he got the permits for me, but on behalf of the owner. Gotcha. So it, it was easier. Because I've never had to do it with a permitting process before, but I've got one of my clients asking about it, and I'm just like, let me check in with some people. Yeah, I mean, it's always easier. Okay, and then you pay less for the permits mm -hmm. if, if the owner pulls them, and then you can say, oh, how much is this basement going to cost? You can say it's going to cost me $10,000, not thirty five. <laughs> Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, pros for the buyer. We did that. Pro, uh, sorry. So this was there any pros for the buyer that we didn't cover? No, we did that. They own the house. We covered this. Um, risks. Technically, the lender can call. We talked about this is the sub. You know, do on sale do clause. On sale clause but we also said that no not. lender is going to take a performing loan and put it in a non-performing category. A buyer can mitigate the risk by um, forming a trust. We talked about that. The, the land trust stuff, the seller's property name, serving the trustee is and they, that they retain control. So um, you guys have any questions about that piece? And that gives a little nuance to me, just like, hey, we're going to put this in a trust as opposed to an LLC. We're going to make the name of the trust be something pretty benign for the purposes of a mortgage company looking is, into it. Is the formation of the trust a fairly quick process? It can happen after you go into contract? Or when, when in the process do you Yeah, like I, I have everything on my documents already by closing, before I go to closing. So my disclosures, power of attorney, everything that I need mm -hmm. is there. And this is the other thing. I'm doing a webinar for the grid community on March 14th. So it's valueamplifier.us if you guys want to register for that. Um, and I'm putting, I'll be doing case studies and stuff like that. And when we're done with the slides, I'll put that value amplifier dot whatever, so you guys can. That's a deeper dive. It's gonna be more tactical, more. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll, we'll we'll cover. Yeah, we'll cover some of the similar stuff too, and then but I'll show you slides, and then also the the question is how are you gonna find these deals? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's the hard yeah. part, mm -hmm. right? So we'll we'll talk about that. Can I just, quick question, do yep. you have any um, advice or guidance as far as who you tap to be your trustee and are they compensated and... Oh, good, good question. So usually I'll, like a friend of mine, someone I trust, right? But, and someone who's reliable, especially if I'm like, hey Matt, you know, I'm, I have a closing in two weeks. Well, my phone doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, so this is the thing, you have, I have it, my trust agreements, I have a trustee and then I have in case of you know, if they're not in, you know, capacitated or whatever, I have Success a second trustee. Yeah, I have a second trustee. Okay. Now, and I pay them $100 a year. The, the trust agreement says that I'll give them $100 a year. Cool. But usually- I guess you should do, you should do, you should, I'm just throwing this out there. You should do like a trustee Party. Holiday extravaganza <laughs> where it's you like open bar, trip? open drink. And like for the people that have been doing this for you for a while, like here's a hundred bucks. No, dude, I'm just thinking throwing this awesome restaurant party. First of all, do you know that I take my trustees out to lunch and dinner? I have them over for Thanksgiving. Yeah, these are, yeah, I've known them for a long time. Can I be a trustee? <laughs> right. um, buyer can mitigate the risk by forming. Gotcha, we talked what, about What that. does a trustee go for? All right, trust set up, calls the fees, and everything. Costs. I mean, twenty co costs. So there are there are coaching programs out there, right? And then you can pay for that. When I was in national, well, now I have my own coaching program. This is the offer that I'm gonna make to you guys. Instead of you paying me a ton of money to do this, I've had people pay me thirty-five thousand dollars a year to coach them for a year. I'm saying you're local. I live in Gainesville. Find the deal. That makes sense. But we'll do it 50-50. Is it worth your time? Is it worth it? So you just gotta tell us what kind of deal you would look for. Well, we'll do it 50-50. Now I am putting together like, like a course and things like that. I'm saying that to you guys because we're local, right? Mm -hmm. We know the markets, things like that. But I'm also doing deals with other students. Um, I'm buying a house in Florida in two weeks. I'm one in DC. I just bought two in Texas. 
And your Facebook, like, can this be deleted if I want to? <laughs> On your page, maybe. Um, so, but just in general, and, and, and that's, a, that's, I mean, think about this, guys. You find the deal, and you have all of the know-how on the other side of it, you're just bird dogging it and you keep 50% because you found something that could be you know, doable. But then she does everything, she sets up the trust. In general though, setting up a trust is know. not an at expensive the, the thing, it's like 1500 bucks or something I don't know, like it could be a couple thousand dollars depending. Don't be surprised if you're talking to attorneys and they have no idea what you're doing, okay? I talked to an attorney today. There's some attorneys that are like scared. Uh, this sounds really complicated. I don't know how to do this. I was like, okay. And Let me teach you how to do your job. <laughs> so like, I have to. Try, I have to. Yes. Sometimes I have to teach them how to do their job, um, or find someone who who understands or who's open, and then you're like, yeah, this is how I want it my way. But if can can you find a lender, get an attorney? Yeah, you could pay a couple thousand dollars for them to do it. But the thing is, are you really going to know the ins and outs how to do it yourself? Did you learn everything that there is to know within an hour of us having a conversation? You don't know what you don't know. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. Until you're face to face with it. Until you're face to face with it. And you know how many investors are, what stops people from doing something? Fear and not knowing what to do. Yeah. That's what, I could have gotten deals like this before I paid my $25,000 for my mentor mm -hmm. back in 2013. Have I paid for education? I paid over $150,000 on education, on learning about trusts, living trusts, you know, doing all these things to protect their personal trusts, for cars, for asset protection. There's so many things to do. Um, and would I do it again? Absolutely. Okay. This is education that you take with you to protect yourself. You're building your wealth, right? So don't think that you're trying to cut, don't try to cut corners. Mm -hmm. And then not have something in place, and then you get bit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to sink the ship on your first deal. Yeah, yeah, you won't be, you won't be floating again anytime soon. Um, I, if it was just a single land trust and that's all, if you're paying more than 5,000, you, you could, you, you could probably- You're in New York the, City, basically. Yeah, you kind of get all you need, like you're, you're doing, planning that is probably yeah. more extensive. I mean, My thought one. would be a thousand's pretty low, three is maybe a little bit on the high side, five you're getting gouged. Um, is that so, not right? No, I mean, I, I was saying uh, my firm treats land trust a little bit um, more, probably more expensive mm -hmm. than your traditional uh, married couple joint leap, uh, living trust okay. just because it, it's, you, it's a it's a it's a document i yeah. mean it, it's 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 not a two-page document right um and, and with you know like i said the a company power of attorneys and things like that nature i'd say five makes sense okay for you're getting a deal okay cool so listen to the attorney i have no idea what i'm talking about all right let's go to this real quick example <laughs> deal because we're going to run out of time and i don't want to um this was a scenario where they used um a subject two for a flip the people he did it backwards. This one? Yes. Oh, yeah? C c well, tell me. I don't know. Yes, because Rob did this one backwards because he bought it from someone who knew how to do subject to deals, and he coached them how to do it. But, yes, this is, instead of buying it up front, he, he didn't necessarily did it the right way. It's just that Rob knew this investor. Rob, you're watching this. I'm just. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> no, no, I mean like so. No, no, so but, but me, it, I don't it, know what it, this it, means. It's, it's a great oh. deal. Um, so the seller won 50k fast, and he wanted to assume the payments and plans to renovate the house. Listed in two months later, so have the hard money. Yeah. So he, so maybe Rob did pay him 50k up front, but instead of taking over the, you know, uh, I use the underlying debt, which I had. So Rob didn't actually buy it. Oh, he, did, he never he didn't transferred need it. title. He never transferred title, right? So the title said, and that only happened because Rob trusted this investor. Of course, yeah. Okay? That's what I'm saying. Don't do that. Well, so scrap what actually happened. The principle is a good one. Like, hey, you've got a house. It's got equity, but you need some money right now. I, as the investor, could see the flip potential in this house. So instead of me buying hard money and, and, and taking from you, let's tra tra 
Yeah. Right. Let's transfer it subject to, I'll give you some money up front, now I control the asset. Instead of having to go get hard money at a 10 and 2 kind of interest rate scenario, I can actually just use my remaining equity, flip the house, get it, I'm going to sell it, and this whole thing is a temporary subject to. It only had to last two, five, six months max right. kind of thing, so that you could kind of not have to go the hard money route. So that, that was smart for that Rob did. So because there was a loan that was 10 years already in there with a low interest rate, instead of getting a hard money lender for that bigger amount, right? So, so that's why that was a good thing that Rob right. did. He's like, hey, I'll make payments to the bank. Okay, I'll give you your money now because you need it now. <clears throat> so he, Rob leveraged. Yeah, I use the existing that, that loan instead of getting new loan for a flip. You can use it, and, you know, just so, think, and think he, outside he the box. It, yeah. Um, we drafted the paperwork. I recorded uh, my interest three months later. Sold the house, paid off the underlying debt, and pocketed fifty k. And like the guy, the seller was happy because they got their money up front. He had the opportunity to renovate the house, knowing what that was going to take. Didn't have to get, you know, didn't have to pay too much on interest. So all win, win, win. All right. Um, Let's go to this lease option. You talked about this in the beginning, and I kind of has asked you to wait to kind of talk a little bit about lease options mm -hmm. and the lease option section. What is a lease option? So you have a lease with an option to purchase the property, or you give a lease with an option to purchase the property as far as ex for your exit. So have I, have I controlled properties with a lease and an option to buy? Yes. And you do that if the seller is not comfortable buying it, if he's selling you the property subject to the existing loan. You can say, I have a backup option for you to sell your property. Because they might say, I'm not comfortable in still having my name on the loan, me being on the hook, and you have title. What happened? You know, this, and I had that once. I had that happen one time. And it was a government employee. Uh, so, so it was more conservative, and it was a property in Gainesville. She may be also worried about like her um, her clearance and like worried uh, about her may, clearance yeah, component it, it, of it. Yeah, I've come across the, the, that. The, the, there, there was that scenario. So she did an, a lease with an option. So I did a lease with an option buy, and the option price was locked in. Okay, so she agreed to that. Now I had the deed in escrow in case something ever happened to her. Like I wanted to protect myself, put everything in escrow. So now what I did was I controlled the property. I don't get tax depreciation, I don't get the tax benefits of zoning it, but it's okay. So I found a tenant buyer, okay, where I did a lease with an option to buy with someone else. They brought, so I gave her $1,000 for the option consideration, and I started making the monthly payments to the, it's like two months later, 60 days later. So during this, during this time, I found a tenant buyer he brought $15,000 down payment yeah, as an option. And my option price was higher than what my option price was for her. Yeah. So you master lease. So that's, it, that, that's how I gave him 15 months. Um, and within that time frame, he was able to purchase. So for those, so for those that didn't understand that, because that's a really interesting scenario. So let me just restate it if I can, and you to correct me what I didn't understand right about the situation. Seller A says, hey, I will rent my property to you, to Matt, for this amount per month, and if you make these payments for a certain period of time and you qualify, you, you, may, you hit the parameters of the option, it allows you to purchase this property for this price at this later date. So you can rent it for a little while and you have to qualify for the option to be valid. Correct. Correct. So the lease amount that I rented it from her was the mortgage amount. Yeah. Okay. And so, the so she was, so yeah, gotcha. So the total carrying costs was what they agreed to. Principal interest tax insurance, homeowners association was what they agreed to make as that lease payment. That was, yes. And you had 60 days to even initiate the starting of those payments. So in that time, she starts marketing to Their renter retail. B yeah. and who wants to ultimately own a home themselves. Yep. Hey, I will lease this for, for principal interest tax like insurance, was... homeowners association plus 50 bucks or $500 or whatever it might be. Yeah. And you meet these same qualifications except your option to purchase it is going to be Fifty thousand dollars higher than what she got it at. So ultimately, she is a wholesaler slash intermediary slash arbitrage expert of connecting two parties that have similar interests because she's the connecting point. Does that so make that, sense? That, that's why you're double. You're doing lease option to control it and lease option to buy it, right? Yeah. 
Now, a lot of properties that I've bought subject to the existing loans, I've exited on a lease option. Why do you like that strategy? I love that strategy because less than 30% of the people exercise the option, okay? Second is, you know why that's an amazing strategy? Because you don't have to deal with tenants and toilets. Mm, so it's the benefits of... So uh, it's like you, you, you're... No headaches. Yeah. No, Your no experience headaches. is less than 30% exercise the option. Mm -hmm. But then the option the consideration they put down is, is not, not refundable. refundable. So we kind of skipped over that, but that is an important piece where they say, hey, in order to do this rent to own, you got to give me 10K, 20K, 30K, whatever might be this agreement, and that is gone. If you don't exercise the option, I'm keeping that. Thanks for playing. We'll go look for contestant B. Does that make sense? Um, you don't, and we mentioned this earlier, but you don't want to do this if you don't want the house to actually be sold, right? You're not going to bet on the 30%. No, some pro like for example, in the property that I had the seller financing, a zero percent interest rate, I, I, you don't want, I don't want that to do a lease option. So I've, I have certain properties that I want to hold long term, and I'll do a three year lease or a four year lease. And now I'm getting into medium term rentals because you could get 2x or 2.5x. I have someone on my team right now, and she just bought a property in Pittsburgh, um, and she she got, you know, for two and a half times, the fair market rent. Yeah. So now I'm like, ooh. Not a lot of competition in there yet. So exactly. So imagine doing it, buying a house subject to, and doing midterm. Have, have you looked in Falls Church yet? No. Is that a good market? <laughs> it's in the perfect triangle between all three of the major hospitals that have the most nursing. Oh, really? Full mm -hmm. terms. Because I know DC, you're not allowed to, no more Airbnbs are not allowed. Mm -hmm. So medium term is probably going to be the key. Yep. Let's do this only because we are two minutes over time and I want to give you guys enough time to kind of network and so on and so forth. We're going to go through. So you understand the ideas of the lease option, the pros for the tenant buyer side, so those that are ultimately going to be acquiring the property is they work towards home ownership. A lot of times people aren't able, you know, these folks might not be able to qualify for a traditional loan right now, whether it be because they have a, you know, they're self-employed or their credit's not that good, whatever it might be, you as the own, you on the selling side of the scenario can kind of determine what are the terms that are okay for you to and then you can rent to own. Yeah, you put them in touch with a lender, you know. Help them, yeah. To help them. Um, build up equity in a rising market. Uh, oh, so the re, this is from the tenant perspective, right? They're like, hey, if I buy it now, I think home values are going to go up over the next two years. I can kind of lock in my purchase right now, and I'm not, you know, I don't own it yet. It's the option that yeah, I own. Yeah, but is that to your advantage? This so is just a tenant. I know for okay, the gotcha. tenant. Is it to their advantage? No, is that if, your if I'm a tenant buyer, right. I want to lock it in. Right. If, I, if, if you're going to be my tenant buyer, do I want to like the price? Meaning if you're the seller? Yes. No. No. Sometimes I like it, but then I have well, a... Unless you're pessimistic I, about the market. No, I have a clause in there that says that if, if I do an appraisal and the appraisal comes up higher, then the price has to be higher. Gotcha. So we're going to get to the seller side of that where you, I want okay. to hear those things, but this is just like for the, oh, this for the, the buyer's the, benefit. This is, like why would a buyer do it? Build up equity and lock in price and terms. But to your point, Naya, um, the seller's pros, pass, make, you just mentioned that, no the more toilets and tenants. No more toilets and tenants, yeah. Um, lock in great price and terms. So, so you a higher price, because my option price is always at least 105%, 5% above the fair market mm -hmm. price. Is what you're trading for somebody who doesn't have the ability to maybe purchase the house Because it's a themselves. future price that you're... Mm -hmm. And when we mentioned collected sizable non-refundable deposit, this is of course always negotiated with the you know the two parties, but it doesn't go back, right? They exercise the option or and they lose their deposit. The closing costs also going to be less because presumably you're not having to deal with the realtor costs. Well, yeah, you don't have realtor costs on on subject to either or anything. Yeah, that's my point. So it, it, it should be on the list. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, that's your profit yeah. margins. That that's you're estimating yeah. that already. Yeah. Because if you're if you're going and on a, the MLS and getting yeah. to, if you're not buying right or if you're not negotiating control properties right, mm -hmm. then you're doing something wrong. Like mm -hmm. I won't pay a hundred percent fair market value. Some investors out there are like, I'll, I'll well, pay above. Is, it's that. one of the exits, and if you're trying to sell as part of your exit, normally one of the costs is the realtor costs. Right? Correct. So or that's why you tell them. Don't. Correct. Yeah. So that should be on the list of benefits. 
I'll send Jessica an email. All right. Um, <laughs> there are new, normally two contracts for uh, types of release options. There's both the rental contract and the option contract. We had an interesting uh, conversation in uh, Reston for those who were at the uh, the Reston meetup when covering um, you know, Reston Grid when covering this was that you could probably and tell me if you've ever come across this sell the option contract apart from the lease contract is there is because the because the option contract has value is it something that could be sold like hey I mean technically yes so if if from if you're the seller right. and I do a lease and an option to buy right a lot of people do that yes okay like you have the lease option but you could sell the option technically to somebody else I, I could I could but I mean, not that it would matter I mean if the terms of the terms you sold you know but but see, a lot of people do that. You, you could do that to an end buyer okay mm -hmm. and then when they exercise, they can pay you off immediately. Then they wipe you out. Like that's called the sandwich lease option. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the option contract normally has a date and time frame. The tenant buyer needs to purchase the home with traditional financing. Normally, as it. Uh, the the financing. tenant buyer needs to purchase the home with a traditional finance. Correct. So when I do it at, like a lease with an option to buy, mm -hmm. obviously they have to go to the bank and get a loan. Um, in order to perform. Mm -hmm. Because of the added flexibility and timing of closing, you can normally charge more than the typical market for rent, obviously, and, and for the sale, of course. Um, tenant buyer will pay over market rent, larger deposit, over market pricing because of the you know, solution that you're creating where they don't need to go to a bank. They don't, can't go, go to a bank right now and get the tr more traditional financing. Always run credit and check landlord references. You want to treat this like a normal rental, right? You you're not trying to, like you mentioned multiple times, you're not trying to make somebody else's problem, you know, your problem. You don't need to take on a tenant that's going to end up destroying no, no, their yes. house. Yes, with, with tenants you want to. And, and this is the other thing. I've had a few instances where people had did lease options and they put money down. Okay, there's some people out there or gurus who mix the lease and the option agreement. Never do that. Because if you have to evict someone, okay, mm -hmm. you don't want to go in front of a judge and have a mixed agreement that says they're person. You don't want to confuse the judge, mm -hmm. and especially if it's so that they gave you ten thousand or fifteen thousand dollars down. I had to evict people, okay, in mm -hmm. Prince William County, that, and I came with a lease, so they didn't perform the lease. I'm like, yeah, Your Honor, here you go. They didn't, they missed mortgage payment, and not mortgage payment, they, they missed the rent, um, so I can evict them, and the judge was fine with it. On one case, the same judge in another case, the tenant wanted he brought the option agreement in place. So the, the judge, judge the, the judge didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 different judge. So, so the judge it ruled differently. Interesting. Yeah, I was like, wow. Okay, that's good to know. But it's, it's good to know. I was. They are two separate contracts, but I guess then but it goes back to like when you're explaining it to the tenant buyer, like, hey. These are two different contracts. No, you're, you're renting it, and then I'm going to give you the option to buy it. Correct. And as long as you don't default on your rent, you always pay on time, okay? Because if you don't pay on time, this is going to be not valid. Yeah. And one of the other is points... Is that part of the lease? Is that written in like another other term section it's of the lease? It's not on the lease. It's written on the option. Okay. Only. Well, I wonder if you should put it on the lease, too, no. so that if you were to take the I don't want to refer to the option on the lease. Because if they don't... I, I'm not referring... I'm not. Ref I'm referring the lease on the option agreement. Okay. I'm not referring the option agreement on my lease agreement, mm -hmm. because if they default, if they're not paying the rent, I could evict them. I could take them to court and say, "Hey, this is a lease." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. But then, in the case that you just said, they in the case that the I said payment. they broke the option agreement, and then they try to you know confuse the judge. It's like, oh, they already paid this money. Money. Then he's like, okay, well, the amount of rent that they owe. Let's reduce it by this amount. I was like, I was like but to your, but to your, her point, and I don't know if it would work because none of us are judges. But what if on the options contract, if they chose to bring it, there is a poison pill in there that says, hey, there is a lease that is an, in, like you're saying in the options. There is a lease that's an independent contract from this document. It did say that. Oh, it so did. I okay. do have that. They're independent contract, mm -hmm. but the judge can do whatever he yeah, wants. Of course. Right. So he did what you know. On one, on one of my cases. It wasn't an issue on the other one. He ruled a little differently. 
I mean, I still got them I'm evicted on both of them. So um, the only thing that you treat the lease option like it is the tenant buyer's house, so they're the responsible for the roofs and the appliances and all that kinds of stuff. Yet you still want to set an expectation that don't be removing any walls. You're not renovating. You're not completely. You want to put some new appliances in. That's fine. But you're going to start removing some things. Like we need to talk about that. So there is some kind of you know somewhat of a minimization of it being their house just yet. Though you want them to understand there are certain responsibilities they would have beyond a normal tenant. Um, collect as large a deposit as possible. Um, a portion of the monthly rent can go towards the closing I've done that, credit. Yes. You know, if if it, they close on time to incentivize them to close on time. Hey, I'm going to give you credit for some of this rent towards your purchase. Is this is an incentivized. This is another good idea. Another golden nugget. If the if the fair market rent is let's say uh, 2,500 in, in this area, if they're willing to pay 2,800, mm -hmm. you can say the owner is willing to match it and give you a $600 rent credit when you exercise the option to buy. So you incentivize them. So technically, your cash flow is higher. Okay. Yeah, three three hundred dollars. You can reduce the, the the option price. You know, by thirty six hundred dollars at the end of the year. But they they paid you more up front. Meaning, instead of doing twenty eight, they so if the fair market rent is twenty five hundred. Thirty one. No. No, no, no. If the fair market rent 25. is twenty five, and I give them the option, and say, hey, if you can do twenty eight hundred. The owner is going to match the three hundred dollars extra you you get. So they would get a three hundred dollar rent credit, right? So if I match three hundred dollars, technically they're getting six hundred dollar rent credit. Are you following me? Yeah, that's very clever. Okay, cool. Um, have a lender ready. Auto draft payments if possible. And perform regular inspections like a typical rent. And tenant may have right to decorate as desired, but must get permission to structure changes. Oh shoot, mm -hmm. that was right there. Um, they can't close on time. There's extension costs, additional deposit possible, renegotiation. Hey, you guys didn't meet the option. We can talk about it again. Do you still want to try this again? You got to give me a new deposit. We're going to maybe increase the rent a little bit, you know, whatever. So you don't necessarily have to end at the end of them not performing the option. You're going to be like, hey, it didn't work out this time. Maybe uh, maybe we can do it again, see if you guys can nail it this time. Um, do you normally give the year long leases? Or do you no, you usually, I, I, so my. I might do 15 or 17 month leases. I always want to make sure that the lease ter ends at the prime real estate market time. Yeah. So, or like I wanted to end the end of April, May, right? Mm -hmm. So that's when I want it to end. So sometimes it's never 12 months or 13 months. It might be 15, 14, whatever. You always want to finish that, you know, you don't want to be September or October because the real estate market slows down. So if you're trying to exit, if you want to sell to a retail buyer, if they don't exercise the option, you want to make sure you're at a time, prime time. Yeah, so um, never like two years, three years. Three I years. mean, you have done that. I, 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 it just depends. When I do normal leases, yes. But with lease options, I don't want to do a three year lease option and like on a price or anything like that. Um, I we have the same thing where all of our rents end May thirtieth, thirty first, thirtieth, whatever of the of the year. Um, I'm fearful, however, that like one year, all five or six tenants are going to be like, ah, we're all moving. I'm like, I got to list all six of these houses at one time. So like, I'm I got to figure out how to maybe. But nobody's you know we've had one or two at most in a given year that wanted to end it. But so I've I've, I've had up to I've had up to eight properties. All I've come at the same time, and you're like, oh, vacant. I've been paying like thirty thousand dollars in mortgages a month. Pass. And I'm like, ah. Um, what we want to take in the way of this discussion is a number of options. Gotcha. So just saying, there's obviously there's lots of different options. We've even added in that you know contract for deed as a fourth of you know in addition to the three that we covered here. Um, I just want to kind of wrap up. All right. So what are the next steps? Um, if you can make sure that if you're not a member of the Grid Facebook group, it is a fantastic group. It's all of the DC, but the nationwide. Grid um, members and leaders of these different offices. I would highly encourage you to become a member of that particular thing. Uh, the Grid uh, local events um, has other things. Those are oftentimes things that you can pay to get more information. Naya, we're going to throw on a tab up here her um, event that she's going to be doing March yeah, I'm 14th. Yeah, the webinar. Yep. And I'll just we'll have it up here on the screen. Work uh, with. Uh, gotcha. If you're a real estate agent and you want to start. Having your license be an asset to work with investors—that's easier. That's not—that's not easier. Excuse me. Um, 
There is a different approach to working with real estate investors as an agent than there is in working with mom and pop home buyers. So if you're an agent, you want to learn more about how to kind of do work with investors, there's a whole course that you can sign up for at gridaiadvisors.com. Questions, aha, what did you learn today? Now we take massive action. Let me put this up here. And while I'm putting this up here, um, any questions that you guys had for Naya? Anything, aha, thoughts? Are you putting the value amplifier? Yes, yes. valueamplifier.us. Us, yes. Thank you so much for coming tonight. My pleasure. Matt, I'm leaving these. Anybody want some of your sisters? Perfect. I have to go pick up children. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Fantastic. Any questions anybody might have? Thoughts? I'm going to end up killing this. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Appreciate it. Comment, share.